All right, everyone, welcome back to another Trap House podcast. My name is Justin Jett. Great guest today with us, Stu Miller of Coon Creek Outdoors. Uh, he's going to sit down here with me and Charlie, and we're just going to talk about pretty much how he got started in this whole thing. If you don't know who Stu is, you might want to hop on YouTube, check out Coon Creek Outdoors, and uh, start surfing through all those videos. He's got a lot, very educational, uh, straight to the point, great trapper, great fur handler. You know, so he's he's good, a good source to learn from if you're out there uh, trying to learn something online in the trapping world. But before we talk to Stu, we got to give it up to our sponsors. We got Top Lot Stretcher Company with us. Their website is toplotstretcherco.com. And they have an adjustable stretcher that we're really uh, fans of here. And they got trapping supplies, DVDs all kinds of different stuff on their website. They got a really nice clean cut website. It's easy to navigate. So head on over there at toplotstretcherco.com. Also, Weeby Knives. Their website is weebyknives.com. Whether you're in the first shed, they got a selection of fleshing knives to choose from. They got skinning knives if you're out in the field. Uh, Filet knives. They got all kinds of stuff in there. Um, Also, another well put together website, easy to navigate. Check them out, weebynice.com. And we have J3 Outdoors with us, j3o.com, maker of the Hags Bracket and Spring Clip. Uh, Jeff Haggerty has a, makes a great product, puts a lot out there, makes basically life a lot easier on the trap line, especially if you're a water trapper. I mean, everything from bait holders to spring clips, tail hooks, the universal lock I think is real slick. Um, if you're a beaver trapper, the beaver rod ends are really nice and handy to have. So check out j3o.com. And they also have some coffee out there, trapline coffee. If you're if you're a coffee drinker, you need something to get you going before you start your trap line. They got three different kinds there: a trapline blend, a Kodiak blend, cherry red blend. And uh check them out at trap traplinecoffee.com. And last but not least. Home of the top dog predator bait at Jet Fuel Predator Lure, HoosierTrapperSupply.com. We got everything you need from trapping to deer scent. Um, and we also have the Show Us Your Bottle Photo Contest going on right now. If you don't know about that, you might want to jump on the website. There's a link on the homepage. Basically, if you're using our lure, bait, or urine, uh, snap a picture of you and your successful catch, and that will pitch you in a drawing to win a $100 gift card. Uh, to Hoosier Trapper Supply. So head over there and check it out. I think I've covered everything. This is getting a little too long here. <laughs> Let's go talk to Stu, and uh, thanks for joining us. All right. Welcome back to another Trap House podcast. Great guest with us today, Stu Miller of Coon Creek Outdoors. First time on, so we're going to probably start from the beginning, how he even got started in all this and uh kind of go from there so welcome to the show man appreciate it no this is cool this is cool so uh how'd you get started in trapping to begin with like kind of grew up with it in the family or just something you found interested in no i i've told this story a couple of times but um we didn't have any trapping that went on around at least my generation you know there was trapping that went on in the 80s whenever the fur boom and then it just died out um where I grew up, it was it was deer hunting. That's what you did. It was you deer hunted, and you know I'd always dabbled in it whenever I was younger. You know everybody wants to try to set a trap or you know, and I had live traps, of course. You know, <laughs> different things like that. And the biggest reason I got into trapping was at home. We have shotgun season. We we shotgun hunt, and you know, so you're limited with your yardage. You know, with the shotgun, and so I got into bow hunting. You know, because that was a little bit more skill involved you know so did the deer hunting with a recurve compound uh, shotgun and then it was right about the time I guess I was I don't know, before I had my driver's license or so but you know you kind of get into where you doing things on your own and uh, muzzle loaders the inline muzzle loaders they had just really become popular and you could really reach out and touch a deer with you know <laughs> with a muzzle loader you know compared to a shotgun anyway right and uh 
So anyway, I saved up and I bought this inline muzzleloader and I'm gonna shoot this deer at like 300 plus yards, you know, and it's gonna be cool. So that's what I did that season. I, I set up everything and and I shot this deer at like 300, three a quarter, I don't know, it was over 300 yards. Shot this deer with a muzzleloader. And it was kind of like, all right, I've done it now. I shot a deer like six, seven yards with a recurve. I shot, <laughs> shot a deer at 300 yards. Like the challenge is no longer there for me, right? And, uh, you know, I was looking for something to challenge myself with basically and I had always got Fur Fishing Game Magazine. That was that was the one that I had always got and there was always you know articles and stories and everything in the back and then those big barn shots and that's what I wanted to have. I was like that, that's my next challenge. I, yeah. want, I want a barn shot like that you know so that got me started in into trapping really. It wasn't anything other than I wanted a challenge and uh yeah, those first few years were tough. <laughs> they were they were tough. Like like I didn't know what I was doing, you know. Yeah. Um, I didn't have really anybody to teach me because this was before the internet was really right. uh, you know, available to anybody. So you just basically had books and magazines and and just going out and failing a bunch of times, you know, and that, that's really what I did. I just failed a whole bunch of times. So you got the challenge you were looking for. I got, <laughs> and then some, right? Yeah. No, it was, uh, it was cool. They, you know, we always had live traps. Everybody had live traps. You know, you had the odd coon or whatever, you know, that needed to be caught. And so I remember I got a hold of an old bunch of rusty footholds. And uh, I actually picked them out of an antique shop because I, that, you know, you couldn't at that time you couldn't go anywhere to to buy them locally, you know. And I didn't know what to order online, and you know, it was really expensive and everything else. So I went to this old antique shop. They had this barrel of old rusty antique traps, which I'm sure that you know they weren't antique, but it was a you know antique shop. <laughs> and I remember I dumped it out this barrel. It was like a whiskey barrel. And I dumped out this barrel and I spent like an hour in there rummaging through and I found a bunch of these old rusty footholds and I bought them. And I'm sure I paid way too much, you know, the guy probably yeah. ripped me off. I don't remember what I paid for them, but it was, it was way too much. And then I was going to be a trapper. I had, I had my footholds and I didn't catch anything for like three weeks, but I had that one live trap and I always caught something in that live trap. <laughs> and, and I remember telling, cause I was the only one doing it at the time, you know, but I had buddies, you know. I, I still remember I was sitting in Buddy's garage when I, and we were talking trapping. I still remember looking. I was like, man, if you want to be a trapper, you gotta you gotta have them live traps. Like that's that's how that's where, <laughs> that's where it's at. Like uh, you can catch stuff in live. If I could have all live traps, I'd be. But of course, you know, just the logistics of it is just so skewed anyway. You know, with price and hauling them around and everything. But yeah, I remember the first couple of years. It was I was a live trap guy because <laughs> you put them out, you could catch something. <laughs> and yeah, you know, it it was uh it just kind of snowballed from there. Obviously, like I, once you struggle hard enough, you're gonna figure something out. And then you know, through the progression of it, um, you know, start identifying different trails and and making different sets. You know, and this this all started small. I, I started with you know like a lot of people. We didn't have muskrats or anything. Everybody says they start out with muskrats. I started out with coons and possums and stuff. You know, and then. Uh, I remember the next year I bought a half a dozen dog proofs and and I set those and I started having a little better success with the dog proofs and I don't I hate to admit and say like the dog proof changed my trapping but but I think what it did was it forced me to identify better locations you know for because I was catching you know it's it's something if you just never have success because then you don't really understand things but whenever you actually start finding success then you start kind of putting the puzzle pieces together. And so that half dozen of dog proofs, I caught a bunch of stuff, and then that kind of led me into being able to foothold trap better, which led into the coyote trapping. And then, you know, four or five years down the road from that, that was where I started catching a lot of fur, you know. Um, there was some money in it too back then. So I was actually able to to pay for my hobby and pay for all my traps. That's one cool thing. Like all my traps were all paid for by the fur that I caught with them. And uh, then of course, I, I you start selling them, you know, what are you gonna do with all this right. stuff? You know, you start having a couple hundred pieces of fur and you skin them and we'd always skin stuff because we'd always ran coon hounds. For as long as I can remember, we'd always ran coon hounds. So we'd always skin them, but we'd never put them up per se. Um, 
so then then I got into that. <laughs> now then that that took over the fur handling because I I love the fur handling side of it and uh, yeah that was cool. That kind of snowballed from there and that's the rest is history basically. Yeah. Um, started the fur handling deal and I got you know pretty proficient at that. I felt like and I mean it, I'd been trapping for I don't know I've been trapping for for several years before the whole YouTube deal came up. Which you know, I don't want to lead into another question, but that everybody always asks why did I start YouTube, and, and YouTube started because I was sitting at the NAFA truck, and there was this this guy came up and he had this bag of Red Fox, and it was his first. And like Red Fox at home are pretty rare. I mean, like they're and this was and he didn't have a bag actually. He just brought them up. They weren't in like a NAFA bag. It was his first time selling, and these things were just butchered. Terrible. <laughs> and I was, man, that's like, he had more Red Fox than I did, you know? And I was like, oh, man. You're like, what a waste. Uh, what? Well, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, it was just, it was like heartbreaking because, man, I could do something with those. And uh, actually, if you look back on, on whenever I started my channel, the date I created my channel, that was the NAFA drop-off. <laughs> actually, yeah. that day, I went home that evening and I started a, a YouTube channel and those were my videos were, were for handling. Mm -hmm. And you know, I always get questions on it because I mean, I'm, I don't, I may have a large YouTube channel, but I am by no means like the best trapper or anything else. You know, it's, I just, I've been doing it for a while. And the fur handling is really what I started on because it was accessible to people. It wasn't accessible to me. Um, maybe you guys remember, but NAFA actually put out mm -hmm. a DVD called Professional Fur Handling mm -hmm. and it would cost $20. Mm -hmm. And not, they didn't promote it very well. No, they didn't. Like, they should have promoted it very well because that was an excellent DVD. The guys they had handling that fur did an awesome job. And I had bought that DVD several years before that. And, because uh, you could buy it. They didn't give it to you. You, know, right. you actually had to buy it. And basically, my fur handling series, which I attribute a lot to the growth of my channel, was basically me more or less copying or showing and breaking down fur handling in a way that that NAFA DVD did because mm -hmm. they broke it down into three steps and they did an awesome job and I I, I mean I kind of mimicked that so to speak and I put it out there for everybody to see for free mm -hmm. you know I mean that's the cool thing about YouTube is you're getting a free education basically right and that's that led into everything else I mean it's that's kind of my backstory on that I mean it's the rest is history, you know, from here. But no, that's kind of how I got started into trapping, and then the progression which led into into YouTube. So, the um, that so you started with, what eighty one roughly, or I mean, um, two thousand one. Uh, yeah, two thousand one, two thousand two. Okay. okay. How old are you? I'm thirty two. Okay. So we saw, I mean, we saw some pretty good years really in yeah the fur, in the fur market mm -hmm. since then. I mean, it's been obviously up and down, but those two thousand and like. 10, 11 through 14. I yeah. mean, those were years that I was making money on fur. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and like I said, I, I was fortunate enough that I've always been the kind of guy, like, I want my hobbies to pay for myself, you know, pay for themselves. And I was able to buy traps. I mean, at, at that time, you know, I don't know how many traps exactly I was running before the, the fur boom, but it definitely helped me and, you know, boosted my, my count. But I remember, you know, you could buy a, a dozen one and a halves for 50 bucks. Right. You could catch two coons at that time. I mean, I, I was selling coons for 25 bucks finished, right. you know, 24, $25 finished. So two coons paid for that dozen of traps. Right. And you know, I had that, that's where my progression went to. I'd always put up on, on wire and I had never washed my fur before that. So those years really helped me out as far as kind of perfecting, if you want to call it my the trade basically I, I went to wood um during those years i made that transition to wood during those high dollar years just for the uniformity of it um i started washing my fur everybody always gets everybody else questions my my washing the fur so southern Illinois coon are not the best coon but whenever you start having uh, several years of selling them and you can actually see a difference in in price you know of of washing out a dirty muddy coon and putting them up versus you know just leaving it muddy that's why i started doing it sure it was because i was selling to the fur trade and i mean that's that's where i kind of perfected that craft if you want to call it that i don't wanna, i don't want to use the word perfect because i'm not perfect by any right. means but 
uh, yeah, that's that, that was a cool time. For, I'm glad I got to experience that that quick ramp and that high, you know, because yeah. I, I learned a lot through that. So yeah, I, I I mean I'd like to believe that we're going to see that again at some point, but who you know who knows? Who knows? I'd like to see it better than it is right now, which is about as bad as it can get. I, I would think you know as far as the full market, <laughs> two and three dollar coyotes are yeah. not not great. Yeah, you know, if, assuming you can even you can you can sell them. Yeah. So you know, and and um, somebody we had done a podcast with Guy Gronwald, and I mean he is not really established any eastern routes east of Illinois mm -hmm. because he doesn't have a use or a need for those raccoons or those coyotes. So it's kind of put him in a dilemma. He could definitely use the bobcats, otters, and um, beaver for mm -hmm. sure. But the, all that other stuff is kind of a, what everybody likes to catch. Yeah. You know, so yeah. is what we have the most numbers of. So I, at this point, I know you're not going to change your perspective, but what do you, what do you think about the idea when the market's like this and you're still selling fur? Are you get, is it, does it really pay to, I mean, you still need to do a decent job putting yes. it up but I don't know that it needs to be as pristine as it was in 2013 no no and actually I have changed my my way that I put up for um, for the most part like when I during that time I was washing every single critter that I had I was getting it or I mean it's some guys tumble I'll just I'll just washed it um, it just went with the rhythm that I had to put up for and I've gone to a less quantity of fur more quality of fur mm -hmm. so i find myself running a lot more dry land sets mm -hmm. than i did back then just so i don't have to deal with the muddy critters um if they're not super muddy i'm not washing them out anymore just because of the markets that i found uh, i used to pleat my tails mm -hmm. i don't know if that i mean that's kind of one of those deals i don't know if it made a difference or not but to me it looked better and i i, I pleated my tails uh i'm no longer doing that i, I just pin them and let them go um you know, just little things like that. I still put everything up on wood because there's still a pride thing. You know, sure. there's still a oh, pride. Yeah. I mean, yeah. like I take pride in that. And, uh, but yeah, there are a few things that I've kind of, I don't want to say slipped on, but I mean, just changed just because you're selling to a different market now, or at least I am. Right. You know, I'm not selling to the, to the fur trade market. I'm selling to the craft market or the tan market. Well, who, if you're going to tan the thing anyway, right off the bat, who cares if that tail's pleated? Right. <laughs> you know, so. Right. right. Um, and you don't have to turn coyotes per side out or anything like that. You no, just, e everything that I tan is, uh, yeah, pretty much, uh, I guess, I'm glad you said coyotes. So, like, all my coyotes this year, I'm skinning with all the feet on. Mm -hmm. um, I'm still, so I would remove ear cartilage um, before. Now I'm splitting the ears on all my coyotes that way because I, I like that look of having that pronounced ear in a tanned pelt. Mm -hmm. So I'm splitting the ears all the way, not removing the cartilage. I'm so leaving, you're, you're turning them inside out? Turning them completely yeah. inside out and leaving the cartilage yeah. in. Yeah. Um, and then leaving all four feet on for, you know, wall hangers and decorative things like that. So, yeah, a few things definitely have changed. I mean, I think by the time you split that ear and skin out them feet it you don't really save any time versus you know right. washing them and and pleating and you know everything else but yeah there are subtle differences that i've kind of developed over the last couple of years you know just with the different markets so right right i think considering and this is a little outside of, but considering the beaver market yeah and that's probably the number one demand item yeah. i mean realistically and that's going to available in any quantities as compared to otter and bobcat the um and the difference that Gronwald will pay between green and put up, I mean, just skinning them and folding them flat and freezing them is probably the most, makes the most sense. Cause it's, yeah. I mean, there was not one put up beaver that I saw. Yeah. Uh, that was at the truck the other day whenever he put up that video. Yeah. So, and I don't think the price, like you said, I don't think the price would have, would have changed. I think know? it's pretty much the same. Yeah. Cause they're super set up to, with the equipment to put those beavers up. Well, so. and they have their way anyway. I mean, right. right. So he he was even advertising a year or two ago that he wanted some that were actually cut up the back. Cut up the back. I remember yeah. that. I remember that. So yeah. he, he had a real specific area that he was wanting right. wanting the the pelts from. But yeah, 
Yeah. Now, so, um, let me reiterate. If you guys are gonna don't don't skin anything off the back. <laughs> don't, yeah. Check. With him. <laughs> yeah. Don't. Yeah. I think that was kind of a special deal. So. <laughs> yeah, that was a, that was a real. I remember he, whenever he said that he had like real specifics on the area that yeah. he wanted. Yeah, and he only needed like two thousand or something. Yeah. So. <laughs> but I mean, that's that's cool that people are finding different markets. You know. Right. Um, right. Yeah. No. I like. And another thing, you know, like I said, my my trapping at least in the last few years has went more to quality over um, quantity. I mean, it was cool back in, you know, kind of that fur boom. I mean, I remember a couple of years that I legitimately paid for all my gas for my trap line through the year with selling possums. Mm -hmm. I mean, like you, you know, I, I, I was averaging, I, I, they didn't give out a top lot award, but I still have a screenshot of, I had a $12 possum at Napa, you yeah. know, but I mean, I averaged like, six seven dollars for these things which was you know more than what coons are going for now um and it was more of a quantity over quality the last few years i've released you know almost as much as i've kept because i there's no need to skin that small coon or that small possum uh, you know skunks obviously i've taken everything you know just because you know, they are worth most money in my area but yeah, I mean, I've also developed a skull market, you know, and these are things that I really didn't do back in the day because it was easier just to go trap a bunch of coons and, right. you know, versus now you're having to really diversify, so. Right. You take, yeah, you take beavers and skunks. Yeah. And you've got all the byproducts is worth as much as the skin, if not more. At least, yeah, every bit of it. Between, yeah. you know, like beavers, you can sell the skull, you can sell the meat, sell the caster, sell the oil sacks, and sell the skin. Yeah. Whereas the skunk, yeah. the essence, the glands, the fat, mm -hmm. the skull, the skin. So, I mean, there's a lot there. There's a lot there. You know, you can go out and instead of trapping 20 coon, you can trap, you know, four skunks and, right. <laughs> and end up with a better day, you right. know. So. Right. <laughs> I mean, there's a limited number of bobcats. So really, they're the same way, too. You can sell the skull. The, you can sell the meat. You can sell the glands if you can get enough put together mm -hmm. versus the skin. So, I mean, there some of this stuff does have a, quite a byproduct market yeah. to it. So, for those of you that are looking for some ways to increase your income. Well, there's still there's still way. I mean, just because you can't sell the fur, there's definitely ways to, and I don't want to throw make money out there, but definitely get rid of your, your fur, you yeah. know. Right. I mean, because it's, I don't, to me, and this is something that, that I, I've mentioned multiple times, but like, there is uh, an imbalance in population that I am seeing at home anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there's nobody hunting and, and trapping these predators anymore, but everybody is still going out to the woods deer and turkey hunting. Right. And so that has kind of been, I guess, not really my focus, but it, it I've become way more aware of it just in the, the past few years because of the, the population. I mean, you go scan a, a cornfield at night now, and there's just eyes shining at you <laughs> everywhere, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and and eventually, you know, you're going to have a problem if you continue to take out of one population and not the other, you know. Right. Either Mother Nature's going to come in and and that's going to be ugly or, you know, you're going to start really seeing a decrease in in other populations just because of, you know, predation and right. nest rating and just everything in general. So Right. Yeah, there there's this idea guys don't like the idea of just going out killing stuff for the sake of killing stuff. But there is, right. there is a, and I, and it's, there is a benefit to this management for sure. Yeah. Uh, it definitely keeps the remaining animals healthier and then, and keeps the balance in place. And as you said, uh, may help protect some turkeys and oh, I think it, deer fawns and yeah. that kind of thing. So. South Dakota, which Illinois is so broke, they're, <laughs> we don't, we don't get studies like that. But South Dakota, uh, if you look into the studies that they've done, I think they have really did a, an awesome job of kind of putting into perspective what the uh, and you want you know nest raiders ground you know predators mm -hmm. what they have done to their waterfowl population and I mean there is a, a really cool correlation between high waterfowl numbers and for high fur prices mm -hmm. I mean that really drove a lot and they've done all these studies you know and that's why now they're having these early seasons to try to try to help out all these birds, you know, and right. waterfowl, pheasants, quail, you know, everything, you know, so. I think, I think Delta waterfowl was kind of the, one of the original Dude, dri yeah. drivers behind um, some of that too. You know, I, I don't, I'm not saying that biologists in South Dakota weren't aware of that. But, yeah, you know, yeah. But, uh, I think it's cool. I, I, I get a kick out of reading those studies and seeing, mm -hmm. the, you know, 
it, there really is an impact, you know. Right, right. So we, we didn't really even mention, for those of you that um, are living in a cave, Stu's, Stu's YouTube channel is Coon Creek Outdoors. So um, if you haven't checked it out, be, cert, be sure to check it out. He's, as far as I know, the largest trapping YouTube page there is um, on the planet. So um, <laughs> we I, we got I, I'm just sitting here thinking we never even said that. So well, you know, I did we, actually. Did you? Yeah. Okay. 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 Charlie, okay. come on. Man. I was asleep. I was asleep. <laughs> well, I'm reminding everyone. I guess I was living in a cave at that point. So um, um, no. Okay. No, I, I mean, it, obviously, it's a great channel. I've watched several videos myself, and I think what it is is you just get it. Uh, like just laying it out there and explaining it, you know, nice and easy to everybody. Well, I, I like I, <laughs> that's what everybody wants. So, and I get a lot of questions on this, and I think I obviously I've been doing this for a long time. That that takes you know that, but I focus more on the educational side of it, um, and then obviously you got to have entertainment. But you know, people, at least in my mind, I mean, I'm. <laughs> You know, I'm an ugly guy that I stutter through my words. Like there's nothing, to, nothing appealing about me. But if you can, if you can educate somebody, and and get them, you know, to kind of understand what your perspective is on stuff, I feel like that is that is what draws an audience. So, and then if you can throw a little bit of entertainment in there, um, that's cool. But in my mind, I've kind of built my channel over the years on the educational side of it, yeah. and I've always tried to be real. You know, it's mm -hmm. not. Um, I don't try to put stuff out there that I don't know a lot about, you know, and I don't want to brag on, brag on myself or, you know, but yeah, I mean, for the most part, I try to put stuff out there that I'm fairly proficient at. So, and I think that that comes into play. I think you can see that through a video, you know, if you, you've got some people and, you know, if they've just watched a video or read a book and they went out and did it for the first time, to me, that's not what I want to see. You know, I would, yeah. I, I would like to see somebody that, that knows what they're talking about and, right. And I think that can come through. I, I get a lot of questions on that all the time, but and, well, and you're the same person on camera as off camera. Well, yeah. I mean, hopefully, yeah. <laughs> hopefully. No, I, I try to be. Uh, I try not to BS my way through through anything because you know I learned a long time ago, and obviously you know this is going into my tenth or eleventh year doing this. You can't lie if you're going through this for this long. You right, know, right. You, you can only lie for so long, and then and then you're trying to cover up a lie or this, that, and the other. So you might as well just. <laughs> Just be honest with the folks and lay it out. Here I am. This yeah. is this is me. These are my problems. Whatever you know. <laughs> this is my problems. <laughs> Deal with it. You yeah. know. So. Yeah, I know what you mean. Trying to just stay in the in the lane of the things you know. But when you do go off and say something about a different topic, you at least you're gonna tell them like, Hey, this is my first time doing yeah. this. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's, it's cool. This is yeah. just what happened, and this is how I'm doing it, and see if it works. Or it's more like a trial and error and people could follow along yeah yeah but don't don't go out there and say oh i'm an expert at this you know then yeah, it'd be exactly. blatantly apparent you know so i i don't know like i said it's i've been doing this 10 years now i've got i don't know pushing 400 videos up on on, on youtube so yeah i mean it, it's been fun i there's a reason that i still do it you know i mean it, it's it's a challenge for sure and uh no, it, it, it's been exciting. I've met awesome people. I mean, I met you guys right here. I'm sitting right here because of <laughs> because of YouTube. You know that the experiences and, and the different things I've been able to, uh, you know, do through YouTube has been been awesome. So it's been fun. So what's the bigger challenge now? Coming up with content for YouTube or trapping? hundred <laughs> percent YouTube. Is that uh, why you're doing it? You want that challenge still? I, yeah, I, I guess so. Well. You know the cool thing about the the trapping side and and YouTube is, I've had videos out there that are eight nine years old and to me they are still just as relevant today as they were whenever I uploaded them. Right. Um, the other cool thing is, I've been doing this for so long. I've seen a lot of people come and go. You know, you'll have a lot of people that that try trapping and then they you know they either figure out it just takes up too much time maybe they don't like it whatever and then they leave but you've always got a new new influx of people trying it right. so as much as i hate to say it a lot of the videos you could almost remake right. and and you'll find that that new audience you know that maybe hasn't 
uh, seen the older videos or things like that. And and for me at least, I've been doing it for so long that I've always said this with trapping. The trapping thing is, is so cool because you're never going to get it just right. You know, you're always going to change. And that's how I am. I mean, I don't think I've done the exact same thing every year, two years in a row. Mm -hmm. So by putting that stuff out there on YouTube, people can see the changes that I've made, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I think that's cool. At least for me, I like to look back and say, okay, five years ago I did this and yes, I still caught fur, but now I'm doing something that I'm tweaking it, doing stuff a little bit and I'm still catching fur. Right. So it all works. And I, I think that's kind of cool, you know, to be able to, to go back and, and, reminisce if you will you know and, and see those subtle changes because just because i do something you guys can do the exact same thing and maybe not have success or you can do something totally different and have great success mm -hmm. you know there's not really one right way to do this and the trapping thing that's that's what i that's what's cool i mean i've always said that before that that's the coolest part is that you are going out into an area that this animal knows better than you ever will and you are trying to get this critter for the most part to step on the top of a soda can like that's hard right <laughs> this right. thing can go anywhere you want and you're trying to trick him in his own house i mean it's you know <laughs> it's no different than you coming into you know uh your house you know and, and moving something you're gonna figure it out you know and i'm trying to trick you on it so right i think that's cool i i, I really enjoy that about the traffic thing so yeah Get that natural progression, and you've got it recorded. You've got you've got it documented. Yeah, that and that you know a lot of this stuff is for me. It's not it's not for the, you know it's something that I can go back and watch. You know, so no, I I think it's cool. It, it's kind of documenting my what has turned into a, you know three to four months a year. This is this is what I live for. You know now. So right, right. I think um, on YouTube a lot of people have come and gone too. As far oh, yeah. as yeah. far as channels and and you got to search through them and obviously yeah. the mainstay channel like yours that's been around for eleven years or whatever. Well, you guys have been around for yeah, I mean, you, like, yeah, just as we, long. But it's legit. I mean, you know, it's not you weren't you know, and people know that. Yeah. So. Um, well, that's part of why we get the same recurring questions all the time. It's because of that influx of those new those new people. In. It's a yeah. yeah, and I mean, you know, the trapping thing. So I, I have access to analytics basically on my page and it, it kind of shows uh, age demographic. And it, it's very interesting whenever you start looking at that because your age demographics or trapping are, are kind of split. You'll have that kind of, you know, teens to early 20s age demographic. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, there'll kind of be a lull through that, you know, 30s, 40s, and then it'll pick back up again. Mm -hmm. And, and you start talking to people and, you know, trapping is one of those things that it takes so much time and so much dedication. You know, it's not like deer hunting where you can just go, oh, I'll just go hunting today and I'll go sit out in the woods. No, if you're trapping, you are dedicated to that. You're married to that sport because you're having to go out there, check those traps every single day. If it's yeah. rainy, weather, windy, whatever. And so I think you see that that difference in, in age demographic because you've got the guys that maybe haven't started a family yet. The younger yeah, guys are still where into I was it. Going with, yep. and it's called life. It's called, you know, life gets <laughs> in the way. Yeah. And so you have that kind of early, early young life, you know, that they get into it and they have a family and kids and everything else. And it takes, you know, priority, obviously. And then once kids get out and get, I'm going to get back into this, what I enjoyed. So I, I always find that kind of interesting, you know, mm -hmm. the age demographic, but. Yeah, and I I, th I think that's spot on. Yeah, I, I think I mean I you know. see it all the time, especially when in the older group uh, when people retire. Yeah, I got more time now. Let's yeah. I'm getting back out in the woods. <laughs> I used to do this when I was a kid. And I'd miss it. And but, I, and that's what you get a lot of people because so much has changed. Yeah, you know, in that time frame where they started, you know, just the techniques and you know even just the way you put up fur and, and sell it and market it so yeah you're 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 really advertising the two really different age groups right you know i always think it was funny when somebody will call up on the sh on the phone at the shop and they'll say and they'll tell you it's like i'm 82 years old or whatever and i've been watching you guys on youtube you know and it's like it's pretty cool to think <laughs> yeah. that they, you got these uh, <laughs> Old guys that are probably pretty challenged by technology, but they're still figuring it out how to how to how to do that. They may not want to place an order on a website, but they'll they'll watch. <laughs> yeah, they want that mail order. <laughs> they'll watch us on YouTube, so which is which is pretty cool. Send me a catalog. Cool. I'll yeah. write in the order. <laughs> <laughs> so you you spoke about you know opportunities with the channel and how you know how it's been great to meet all these people. 
You you had a pretty cool experience being on the Meat Eater podcast. Can you talk about that a little bit? Meeting Steve Rinella and those guys because yeah. obviously we're fans. We watch you know listen to the show and watch the show. No, Meat Eater was cool. Um, and everybody always asks, you know, why why do I get you know what was so special about me? And I have absolutely no idea. You know why? <laughs> uh, but no, it, it was very cool. And the Meat Eater podcast was was cool because. I had the opportunity to spend quite a little bit of time with Steve, and he is exactly the same person that you see on camera, off camera, uh, which I thought was really, really cool. I, I, I've been around some people, and they, they are different, and I thought that was really, really cool to, to be around somebody in that, you know, that has that much influence on people that, that's exactly the same person um, off camera. But yeah, it was it was really cool because Steve is super... I don't know, kind of scientific, I, I guess would be the proper, I don't really know how to put it, but I mean, <laughs> it, it puts a lot of thought into it, you know, because he's a very smart individual, you know, and he's got a lot of contacts, so I mean, he, he can really, really analyze a situation, so it, that was something running around and, uh, and, and being able to track with him that I, I, I mean, I guess I really hadn't thought about, you know, that he was pointing out things that I really hadn't thought about just as far as, um, you know, a lot of data, tracking collars, and uh, he has the opportunity to speak with a bunch of biologists and stuff, and just little things like this that I thought was super cool. But, no, I think it's awesome that, that somebody like Renella and, you know, Meat Eater are, are for trapping and pushing trapping because it was it was an awesome experience for me. Um, I was able to go out and, and kind of show some fur handling skills to those guys and, you know, hopefully benefit them but no, I really enjoyed it. it it was super cool and to see see somebody who's got that much influence over people who's really promoting trapping um I, I don't know it's cool yeah I don't know did I veer off there I felt like I veered off no no, no but no, no it, it was no, really yeah. cool uh it, it was an awesome experience something that you know I'll never I'll never forget so I no, enjoyed that I think it's safe to say with what Steve's done with Meat Eater of course what the show is really ultimately a about is like the harvest of an animal and how to yeah. what, how to prep it and eat it but he with his audience i think is you could pretty much say he's done more for the trapping community than anything else out there yeah in, in recent years for sure yeah yeah you mm -hmm. know he does bring it in to you know the show every now and then and having guys like you on there shed some light on some things where mm -hmm. you know the average hunter might not even see at all yeah and so it's great I think it's super cool, you know, because I don't know. I, I've got this. I, I'll tell a story here quick because I think this is super cool to see. <laughs> so, a couple years ago, I had the opportunity to go to the NTA in Iowa, and uh, Bill Duke actually, he was flying up <laughs> in his plane, right? And, and, uh, and he was going kind of right by where I live, and he, he invited me to go. He, he asked me, he said, are you, are you going to go? And I said, no, it's like 14 hours. I, I can't swing it. He goes, well, if you want, fly up in my plane. <laughs> I was like, oh, 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 yeah, yeah. And I, mind you, I was, so I was, what, 30 years? I had never flown in a plane in my life, you know. So this was super, I was checking a bunch of stuff off my bucket list, you know. I'm like, I'm going to fly, I'm going to go to the NTA. Anyway. Does he have a license or? Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> Real nice plane. No handles in it, by the way. No, no handles in it. So anyway, he picks me up at the airport, and he's got this co-pilot uh, with him. And it turns out it was just this young kid, and Bill was part of this program where you basically take um, up and coming pilots who need hours, similar like driving license, and you know you, you can take them and they can get their hours. You know, I, I remember because we we flew before before daylight, you know, so we had some dark hours, you know, different things like that. Anyway, I just assumed that Bill and this kid like had talked and knew each other, you know, and it's like <laughs> I was wrong, by the way. And, and, and so I just assumed, because we're in this tiny little, you know, Cessna plane, and it was like a four-hour flight, and, you know, we're talking, and then we hit turbulence, and then we fall out of the sky like 30 feet, and I'm looking for handles to grab onto, and there is none, by the way, in those planes. It's just a round bubble, so I was freaked out. <laughs> and I don't blame you. I, I, I was, and then I look forward, and them guys, you know, they experience, they're just like nothing happened, and I'm sitting there going, there is no handle in this stupid little bubble that I'm in. And, <laughs> So anyway, we spent a good life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm looking down. down like, Your ground's getting close, but no, it, it was super cool experience. But 
So we fly up, and the whole time I'm thinking, this guy knows who, who Bill Duke is. Um, turns out he didn't. So we, we land at the airport, and uh, a couple other guys came and picked this up, and we drive to the, the convention center there. And this was in Iowa, and it was, what, August? So it was, it like, was like 95 degrees. 95 degrees. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you can only imagine whenever you walked into that first building, all the wonderful smells that hit you. Right. And I, like I said, I've talked with this kid and this, this kid, he was probably 25 years old or so. And he was from Chicago. <laughs> he had no clue. And he had absolutely no clue. And, and it, you could tell whenever that, that first wave of skunk essence hit him, like, <laughs> like he was like, what did I walk into? And the whole time, like I said, I feel looking back, I'm like, why didn't we talk about where we were going? But anyway, I looked at this kid and I was like, do you know who you flew up here with or, you know, where you're at? He goes, I have no idea. That's funny. <laughs> I'm like, well, there may be a problem there. We'll discuss later anyway. So this, this kid, he, he did not even know that trapping even existed. Mm -hmm. And, and. It was really cool. So we walked in, and I mean, he is just you know jaw to the floor, eyes wide open, holding his nose. You know, <laughs> it was. It was just... So anyway, I start telling. I was like, no, okay, you just flew up with Bill Duke. He's the owner of a of a trap company, and you know, for a big trap company, a big trap, like yeah. the, one of the largest <laughs> trap companies. Like, like, yeah, you were anyway. And I said, this is this is what he does. Is he sells traps? And I, whenever I said traps, and you know, you could see in this kid's eyes that. It was like the Disney bear trap, like right. that, you know, and, right. and that's like, and he's like, so what are all these people here for? And I told him, I said, this is a, this is a convention. This is where people come to, you know, and kind of explain those things. And so we walked into the convention and there was Duke's booth there, you know, and they've got a booth with all their traps and he's looking at them and, and kind of funny. I was like, so have you ever seen one of these? And he said, no. And I said, so do you understand how they work? And he said, yeah. Like, you know, break your leg, cut your hand, uh, <laughs> chop the leg off. <laughs> and, that's, and that's what he, you know, assumed. And I, so I did, I, I grabbed a, a number three off the display there and I set it and I stuck my hand in it and I wiggled my fingers at him. I was like, this is what trapping is about. And it was so cool because for the next like hour and a half, two hours, I walked this, this kid around. I call him kid cause he was just a few years younger than me. Anyway, I walked this, <laughs> I can do that. I'm old enough now. But anyway, <laughs> I, I, I walked this guy around and we covered that whole convention and I basically gave him a just a, a crash course on trapping and, and fur handling and just the whole industry in general. And it was super cool. I'd never been around anybody that was, you know, that ignorant to trapping. Right. You know, I don't say that in a negative way, but like he just didn't yeah. know. If that, you don't know, you don't know. He like, just didn't know that this existed. Um, and, and what he did know of it was was very skewed and, and bad you know and, and we got and like I said we spent you know quite a little time walking around we sat down and had lunch and I was like so what do you think of all this and he looked at me he goes you know I I honestly will never use anything I just learned <laughs> ever again he said I'm gonna have to throw away my clothes whenever I get back <laughs> but he said I am so glad that I experienced this he said if I whenever I go back I'll be able to tell people you know and right. if I ever come to this position and you know see a trap or, or do something similar he's like I, I really this was a very cool experience to me to be able to <laughs> to see this and that, I, to me that just stands out because oh, yeah. I think you know moving forward and, and that's why I try to push education because you know, for the most part, it's not the people that are doing it that you're trying to, to teach. A lot of it's the people that don't understand it that teach because those are the people that's, that's going to hurt you worse, you right. know. So if you can yeah. show them, um, you know, that this this is a, a good thing, you know, we've got a renewable resource here, you know, we're not we're not hunting feet, you know, <laughs> we're not breaking bones here. We're, we're doing this in a positive light. No endangered species. No, every, yeah. everything's, you know, hundred percent by the book legal. Yeah. And I mean, these are the people that, you know, if you can educate these people and I, and I always say that, and I don't say that in a negative way, but you're trying to educate the uneducated. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but you know, and I've used this reference before. I'm not a rocket scientist. I'm ignorant and I'm uneducated in rocket science, you know, same as people are, you know, uneducated in trapping. But if you educate them about it and you teach them different things, these are the people that's going to keep this, 
this sport alive, you know. And right. so yeah. I don't know. That that's my story. That that was my first time as far as ever being around somebody that was completely new to it. And I I think it was cool. I I, I had an awesome time, and I think I really did make an impact on on the guys. So and that's yeah, and that and that's huge. And then, you know it's that that idea that everybody's like five people away from knowing everybody in the world. Yeah. So this guy's gonna go home, and whenever that subject comes up, yeah, he's gonna have a positive explanation of it. Yeah. You know. So yeah. I mean, it's all. He never a, has to trap again as no, long I mean, as he sees us in a better light than yeah. we did before. And I, you know, I say it all the time, is, is this idea of if you can expose people to this, then that takes away the, the, it, the it negative. It takes down that curtain and yeah. it just opens up, you know, yeah. what, what it really is about, you know. Right. Because, I, I mean... For the most part, everybody is so skewed on their right. on their thought process of what this is, just because of what you know the media or you right. know right. everybody in general has portrayed this as. You know, so. right? Exactly. So did he fly home with you guys then too? Yes. So I mean, he had to spend the three days there or whatever we, it was. No, we actually well, that was we actually did that whole trip <laughs> in one day. Oh, okay. Yeah, wow. we left at like I don't know two or three o'clock in the morning. We flew up there. Spent the day and then flew back. Okay, <laughs> so it was it was a very long day. Um, it is a long. Day. I think that was actually the first time I ever met you. Was there? Was it? Was that Iowa? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That was yeah. So you were making the, you were making quick rounds. I would I you were <laughs> covering a lot of ground quick that day. Yeah, yeah I was out of the booth and I came back. He said, "Hey, Stuart, <laughs> <laughs> where did you get to meet the guy? Where did he go?" <laughs> So and for, and for those of you that have never been to a trappers convention, they and it really doesn't matter if it's hot or not. There's quite a smell to them because all the lure you can't contain them. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. and it, it's Scum, gonna it's gonna hit you. Now, you're not gonna have to burn your clothes or anything, but but uh, you may have to wash them. <laughs> uh, some people like. Uh, are oh, you? most trappers love that smell. Oh, so yeah. When they build in, yeah. they, they know where they're at, oh, and they yeah. feel like they're at home in their fur shed. Skunk <laughs> essence to me, like if you put like fresh skunk essence and sniff it, like it's a little potent. But that little hint of skunk essence, I've learned to really like it. And, it right. <laughs> and it's weird because, like, you'll start trapping season, you haven't smelled it in a long time, you know, other than, like, a roadkill or something. And by the end of season, you're like, I kind of miss that little bit. <laughs> you know, like, it just, it's just there. Yeah, so, one, yeah, one's hit on the road and you're thinking, man, this, that was a good time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you, you reminisce through smells. Is it? <laughs> we were with Matt Brettaway last week, uh, last weekend on a, just doing a, Right along with him and, and filming him, and of course he caught a skunk and the thing sprayed. He didn't have a syringe, so he shot it and it's spraying everywhere. And he goes and resets the trap, and of course he's walking in the you know. So we smelled skunk the rest of the day, but it was funny just to, within a pretty short period of time, you don't even realize it's in the cab of the truck. Oh, know? yeah, so it's just, but of course, everybody else does. Yeah, but I was, I had a work truck there for a while and I, I had a guy riding with me and I would always like <laughs> I mean that and this was kind of back in the time where like I was veering for stuff you know on the road like I mean it was it was worth it to like you weren't veering away from you were veering towards it you know you'd stop pick up roadkill I mean let's pay for your gas for the day you know <laughs> and, and I remember I'd roll up to pick up this guy and Hey, well, you caught a skunk last night, didn't you? Yep. I'll drive myself. <laughs> I'll drive myself. <laughs> I'll drive myself today. We, we don't have to ride together. <laughs> well, th this is a sh real short story. We won't go into detail, but to, sh to point out the fact that trappers love skunk smell is we know a person that spent time in prison that was a trapper, and when he got out, when he first smelled a uh, skunk hit on the side of the road or whatever, he cried. Because it meant that much to him. <laughs> Reminisced about all that stuff. That's <laughs> just crazy. And the other, the other thing in recent years that's probably more odd was people would come in the shop and said that was their first tip that they had COVID because they could not smell skunk. Really? Yeah. I don't know how many times we heard that over the past two years. That was their they, and they weren't they, symptomatic otherwise. But they would have their their trap lure and they could not <laughs> smell they it could. at all. And they're just like, whoa. <laughs> That's probably a sign. <laughs> That's wild. <laughs> so, so we should. Uh, so, what's going on for the rest of your season? Like, the, why are you in this part of the country? You're traveling through. You're doing something pretty cool. I think you should probably maybe mention that. And then, what what's your plans for the rest of the season? Yeah. So, obviously, been doing this so long. I'm always trying to. I was trying to come up with content, but also just you know involve different people. So. With this being my my tenth year doing it, I wanted to give back uh, to the community. So this is the first year I've done this, and I actually I'm on my way back from uh, doing a giveaway. Uh, I was able to 
to give away, and I, I don't want this to sound bad, but I was able, I, I know how it sounds, but uh, basically what I was able to do was, was choose two different people through a giveaway and then go and spend uh, a couple of days and do kind of like a one-on-one -on -one class with them. Um, so I was able to, to choose a, a adult youth, that's where I'm coming back from, uh, I sh actually just got back. The guy's name was Willie. He had four young daughters, uh, which was super cool. I just spent a couple of days with them, and and we did some trapping, we did some fur handling, um, and and you know the cool thing was like, obviously I didn't know what I was getting into. This is the first time I've done it, but uh, no, super cool to be able to to kind of share, you know, my passion for the hobbies to somebody, and, and you know Willie with sharing his daughters, it was super cool to have them out there running around and. Uh, you know, just showing them a light because Willie, although he, he, he's into trapping, he wasn't quite into the trapping quite as much as I am, you know, so mm -hmm. to kind of give him a different perspective. Uh, no, it was super cool. So yeah, we're doing giveaways and, uh, that's where I'm coming back from now. I am also looking into, um, so for the rest of the year, just to kind of, so obviously with the fur prices, I'm not trapping the quantity that I normally do, you know, so I've, I've kind of trapped what I need to, if you will. And I'm trying to, and I said, I'm trying to fun trap basically this year. So like try different techniques and stuff. Like I've been setting a lot of traps on logs and cross over, you know, like the old books and yeah. just, just trying new things out, you know, yeah. just, just fun stuff. Cause it doesn't, you know, it's, it's not money driven, you know, right. right. It's uh it's just going out and having a good time. Um, I've got a couple of, uh, trips plan there where I'm going to go trap on a river uh, and kind of do like a, a spike tent camp if you will and and do that you know not not so much focused so much on the catching of the critters but more on the experience of right. it right um, if the weather permits and if I can swing it I, I I've always wanted to learn how to snare in Illinois we can't snare and that has always been something that I've I've wanted to learn because I mean, I, it, it's, it's a skill like anything right. else. Um, and I know I'm not good at it. So, uh, I, I hope hopefully through the rest of this year, I'll be able to, uh, to go on a couple of small trips and go to States that allow snaring. Mm -hmm. And, and I think it'd be cool, um, you know, to be able to experience something that I've not been able to do in the past. So that's kind of my forward look for the rest of the year. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds cool. That's one thing too. We we generally don't snare. I mean, yeah. here in Indiana, if you snare, you have to have written permission from the landowner, which is a bit of a. Um, some don't want to do that, mm -hmm. you know, and 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 so we just kind of generally avoid it. And we are in a agricultural area, but we're also in a fairly high residential area, yeah. you know, with that urban sprawl or whatever. So you always got to be concerned about. Um, someone's dog or yeah you know oh, whatever sure. so and then when we go on um, the trips we take in the fall or in the in uh, January and February we're almost always on public ground mm -hmm. which is another concern with hunting dogs yeah um, so we just generally pretty much stay away from it and it would be we, we did go up and run snares with Mark Stack yeah. um, but yeah. uh, uh, it would be cool to just go someplace where you knew that you didn't have to be concerned about that other stuff. Yeah, and that's and I mean, you know, kind of like what you guys do. I've always that's been one thing I've always admired is you guys take those trips and you know experience new things. And so that's kind of where I'm at, kind of this year. Mm -hmm. Is, I mean, I don't want to say I've got it figured out at home, but like I want to try new things and mm -hmm. try new places. So rather than just going hard for an entire season at home, um, I can break it up with these these short trips, you know, and, and try to try to re-educate myself, you right, know, learn right. new things. And cause I, I had the opportunity last year to go to Montana for the first time and I tried, we didn't do a lot of snare and it, it was a pretty quick run. And, uh, I mainly just did footholds cause that's what I was comfortable with. You mm -hmm. know, we were, were there, we wanted to, you know, make a few catches and I was very humbled by that. I mean, it, it was very humbling by that, that area. Um, because honestly, I, in all the years I've trapped, I've never really trapped outside of my little home base. You know, 100 miles from my house is kind of where, so it's all the same terrain. And being able to go out there uh, to an area that was so different than my home ground, it was hard. It was, I mean, like, like I, I was trying to put everything in that I've learned for so many years, you know, set on sign and follow the terrain and this, that, and the other. But there was a lot of differences in it. And, and it's so massive. It's so massive. And like... You know, one thing that got me was the area that we were in, 
they just didn't get rain or weather, mm -hmm. you know, really. So at home, come trapping season, it rained for the most part. This year's a little different with the, with the drought, but for the most part, it rains once a week. So the sign that you're seeing is, fresh, fresh. is fairly fresh. Out there, they had like an inch and a half of rain the entire year. So although you were seeing sign, that sign may be, you know, three weeks old. If right. you're in an area that it didn't get wind blown or, or you know, weathered, uh, and that that was that was difficult to go through and to differentiate, you know, between what was super super fresh sign or, um, you know, sign that may have been there for a for right. a month because it kind of looks the same, honestly, right. you know. So you were looking more towards you know scat and you know what little bit of water, you know, that the mud and it was just really different. So and it was super challenging. So that's kind of where I want to kind of push myself and. Well, the fur prices are low. I'll go up and challenge myself. You know, yeah. I mean, why not? You know, so yeah, I definitely like the challenge of a new area that you've never yeah. been to before. Like yeah. going in blind, go you know, it's kind of cool. We ran into that in New Mexico with it's semi. Uh, I mean, high desert, yep. so it's, it's uh, at minimum semi arid. I would say it was, and they'd been on a ten year drought yeah. when we were there. So the sign, it was, it was pretty hard to really <laughs> pinpoint how old that sign really mm -hmm. was, and it would, it would maintain it fairly fresh look to it you know so but um yeah that was one thing that uh, like out there i you know at home you're looking for draws and pinch points and crossover and you're looking for the same thing out there but we actually had snow the very last day the day we pulled out there and that's where it was like really eye-opening okay. you know because it turned i mean where i was setting there was sign but like the cattle trails and the fence rows and the stuff, that's where the majority of the sign was. Uh, you know, it wasn't really, I was, I was trying to set low areas, you know, kind of similar to what I said at home. And like I said, there was sign you could see because the snow tells all, you know, and it just pisses you off. But no, <laughs> out there, it, it was really interesting. So I don't know. I've got kind of this in the back of my mind. It's like, I want to come back. Like, like I, you know what I mean? Like, I want to go back out there now because... You know, although we did catch, we didn't catch like I wanted to, mm -hmm. you know. So I've got this in the back. I'm going to get you this time. So. <laughs> the redemption trip. Yeah, yeah. Really, I mean, it is. And just, you know, then like I said, the simple fact of learning a new technique. Right. Um, to me, that I, I find that super, super interesting. So One thing on our bucket list is we want to we want to go Martin and Fisher Trap. Mm -hmm. And um, we would love to catch a mountain lion at some point you know which is not a fur animal but it would still be cool to oh yeah, yeah so yeah. but um i don't know we're, we're, every year all these years of getting involved trapping i don't know what 17 years 18 years now i don't know every year there's been something new that i've never done before yeah so that's just just keep it going you know it's awesome yeah. it's funny you were talking about sign and setting on sign is a great plan but it doesn't always work no because there's something like in Arkansas, it is other than droppings on the road, it is next. It is very difficult to actually find sign yeah. unless you can find a little wash along the edge of the road that we have a recent rain and there might be some cat tracks in yeah. there or something. Some gravel. Or... Yeah, I mean in general, we see very little sign. So we're just setting on either past history locations or locations that just look like they make sense from uh, uh, the map or you know what you just think in your mind. And, and you know, it's funny you bring that up because. At least for me, I've always preached set on sign. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I think sign's a relative term. You know, whether you have actual footprints in the in the mud or scat or right. or something, you know, something. But I've always preached that. And it's funny because just, you know, yesterday or the day before with the giveaway winners, um, we were out there and we were trapping his, his piece of property, basically. So his 40 acres. And it was laid out really cool. Um, you know, he had a creek and, and a back field and an agricultural area, but that's what we had to trap. So it wasn't like you could go through and cherry pick, you know, the best of the best. It's we had to pick the best spot on his property. Right. Um, you know, which is a little challenging really, you know, but anyway, we started talking canine trapping and we started looking around and they were the same way as what we are back home. It, drought, very little sign, you know, it's just in hard clay, you're not going to see a footprint, you know right. I mean? It just... And we started looking around, and uh, I, I said, well, I said, you know, we, we want to make a coyote set. He wanted to, you know, see how I make my coyote sets and everything else. And we started looking around. I was like, I finally just told him after a long, I was like, this is the best area. And, and we looked, and he goes, but there's no sign. And he called me out on what I've been, you know what I mean? He, he's, like, he's like, there is no sign. And I was like, 
And I, and I had to stop. The, I was like, you're right. And I mean, I've always preached set on sign, but he, he called me out on it. And he, I said, and I, so I had to kind of back up and say, no, there is no sign, but let's, let's look at this a little different way here you know um this is like the funnel the draw of your property this is a point like past history and and it was really cool because like he got me but then at the same time i was like this is kind of where it this is this, still the sign this is still the sign like if i had to pick one area in this piece of property and and then it was really cool because um i said let me show you what i'm talking about and and so i took my drone and i flew it up and we got the aerial view mm -hmm. and you could ha see how everything came together and drew out. And I said, this is, of all the places you have to trap, this is still the one place. And right. Like, we didn't catch anything, you know, it was a one night check on K9, right. so. Uh, but Did no. Did you leave them? Did he leave the trap there? Yeah, yeah, we left. They might catch something this week. He, yeah, okay. he, yeah, he left traps, uh, you know, like I said, it was a, a lot of trail identification and, uh, you know, one of the cool things that I, he he took away at least he told me was um, I knew we had one night to catch and you know obviously we had the kids so we wanted to we wanted to catch anything you know really um, just just see something and you know I trap with a lot a lot of dog proofs at home just because of the areas that I trap I'm I'm forced to trap that but you know footholds are still like king they're gonna catch everything and and one thing this time of year especially um, that I've learned is dog proofs are you know you're not always going to catch on a dog proof right. um they, they will walk by them you know and so we did a lot of blind sets because we were trying to catch and 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 we ended up actually catching in the blind sets and that was one thing that he he said wow he said i never really put that much yeah you know thought into the blind set you know how effective they could be you know you I, a lot of people i think are under the impression you've got to have all these smells and baits and everything else well you're catching an animal and we, we didn't use conibear you know we could have used if we could have used conibears you know we could have used that too which is basically kind of a blind set we blind set with footholds but yeah you're, you're targeting an animal that that doesn't have to be hungry that doesn't have to be attracted to a smell he right. just got to be just walking right and you can catch him so that was kind of cool to, to see that kind of light bulb go off and i think that's the advantage of the snaring you know because you are for one thing, you're catching them when they're not thinking about anything yeah. else. They're not, their guard's not up, they're whatever. I, there was a video that Matt Jones put out, and I remember he had run into his buddy who had a few animals in the truck, and he goes, I've just checked 80 some sets and I have not caught an animal, and this other guy was just snaring. Yeah. And he was, you know, so clearly they, they were moving to a point, but they weren't interested in bait or lure or yeah. like committing, or the location was not the greatest that evening. I don't know uh, specifically, but. But yeah, I mean, you're that—that that is an advantage. And a lot of times on the raccoons, the combination of some body traps, some two twenties with, yeah. you know, dog proofs is oh. ideal. Oh, it's killer! I, I mean, it's funny because, at least in my mind, and maybe you guys have seen this too, but whenever you're trapping, like, I mean, we have a like ninety plus day season around about, you know, mm. and in past years, I've had traps out all ninety days, you know. Mm. I mean, like you're, and you start seeing these progressions. Everybody just assumes that these critters are running every night and it's just not the case. Yeah. I mean, you will, and you can start playing weather changes and, and moon change. And if you really want to pick out the best days, which is kind of what I've been doing this year, you mm -hmm. know, just because, I mean, you can up your percentages tenfold, right. you know, by, by choosing those, those good days that the critters are actually going to move. And that's kind of what, like the snaring thing. So in Illinois, you know, I have worked, very hard over the years to try to like get the best weather proof set you know because we end up with our weather is just it's so back and forth it, we, it's never consistent to anything it never just freezes up and it or it never just stays dry you know you've always got this freeze and thaw and even with the best you know whatever you use for a cover on your on your footholds or or bait and lure i still think you have you know, in my mind, 15 to 20 days a season that your stuff's just not really working, you know, at least not to the yeah. effect that you want it yeah. to. Where if we had a, you know, cable restrainer snare season, those things are working regardless of weather. The only time they don't is if you have a crazy bad ice storm. Crazy bad ice storm or Which like a huge dump of rare. snow or yeah. something, you know. So, yeah, no, I, I think, you know, having that kind of tool in my... Yeah, in my tool about you know, and learn. I think that would be super cool. So, yes, yeah, snares, and I mean, they. I, I guess you could put 
the snares and kind of the blind set of the yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, where I can't use them. But yeah, I mean, I, and I do, and I catch a lot of coyotes every year in blind sets, uh, especially this time of year where like we just had our firearm season mm -hmm. and I, maybe this is just me, but like those coyotes will hole up for a week after firearm season on all those wounded deer cart. They just oh, yeah. do not move like they do other times of the year. And you think, you think of that as because of ready food which, yeah. and then also all the human activity in the woods. You think that has any, I think it, it pushes them around. I really do yeah. because yeah. to me, and I, I've had the opportunity to run a lot of trail cameras this year. And so I have seen like right now, um, actually just yesterday, whenever I checked them, all my pictures of coyotes for the day were in the deep timber. Yeah. I did not have one coyote on the edge of the field. That is interesting. And, and I kind of, and, and I've always noticed this because that's one thing I've been kind of playing around to is with the trail cameras this year, you know, which is super educational to me, you know, cause it, it kind of puts into perspective, um, what I've always thought over the years, but now you're actually seeing it happen. You know, it's kind of like fishing. Like, like you, you go to this lake for so many years and then you get the map of this lake and then yeah. you're like, I knew that was there. I didn't know why it was there, what it was, but you know, and it's kind of the same way. So I've been using that tool quite a bit this year, um, to my advantage, but yeah, I thought it was super interesting. Uh, four trail cameras out and every picture was a coyote in deep timber. Yeah. And I think that's because of activity. Um, you know, they're, they're laid up and they're, why would you go anywhere? If you're a coyote and you've got a couple of dead deer there. Right. I mean, you don't need to get up and move around. Right. So, right. And you'll see, and I, I mean, uh, uh, past years, I mean, I've been doing this long enough where you'll see the progression in trapping pick up now mm -hmm. after our firearm season goes through. So I thought that was cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, different, different things you catch on, you know, so. Hmm. Well, <laughs> probably, we need to wrap this one up. If you got any last things you want to say? No, this was awesome. This was fun. <laughs> so we will, we will do this again. Yeah. We're going to do a part two at some point. Yeah. Because so. we, we didn't even get into all this DIY and build a boat and fishing and all of that. Well, stuff. Yeah. yeah stuff. All the good stuff. So we got... We got, no. a lot, we got a lot more. Oh, no, no, this so. is this is super cool. I, so. I like that. This. this is so different than what I do normally. You know, just, <laughs> right. Just to be able to just to talk, you know, so and, and not have a, a, a true agenda, you know, I guess. It, yeah. Uh, yeah. Just have a conversation. Just so, have yeah. a conversation. Yeah. yeah. No, this yeah. is super cool. Discussion so. instead of interview. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I like to put it. More the laid back approach. That's more natural. Yeah. Yeah. So check us out next time when that rolls around. Check out all the links below. Coon Creek Outdoors. Subscribe, like that page, and uh, he's got hoodies and t-shirts for sale on HoosierTrapperSupply.com through us, so yeah, I think that covers it. That gets us started. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's been fun. <laughs>